Fever. Who's got the fever? I do. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It's Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. I have a fever and the fever. Here in Nashville, having come off a great live show last night, heading to Pittsburgh for Thursday night. If you're in Pittsburgh City Winery, I'll be there. But all eyes were on Brooklyn and the WNBA draft. More pregame talk, more excitement about Caitlin Clark going one. Where's Reese going? What about Cardosa? Mortal enemies in the NCAA tournament one week, teammates the next. Welcome to Chicago. First pick on the clock, Caitlin Clark drafted. She was a little anxious, she said, didn't know for sure. It's one of those things when you're being drafted and we tell the player that we're drafting you and there's absolutely nothing that will stop us from drafting you. The anxiety is, well, if there's people who choose before us, then of course they could draft the person. But when you've got the number one pick overall and you're told you're being drafted, I think it takes the anxiety away. I don't think something was gonna come up right before like a leaked video of her on the bong pipe or something the way that happens from time to time with people who are being drafted. No, I think that Caitlin Clark was going to be a fever. And I would assume that Fanatics was ready. Sell the uniforms. The ticket people were ready. Just like when Zion went to the Pelicans in the lottery, when the lottery was won by the Pelicans that year, and they took Zion. I talk about that moment every day because I still think about it every day. The sales team was way happier than the front office. How did that work out? I guess the Pelicans are in a playing game, so that's good. So Fanatics starts selling Caitlin Clark jerseys. The monetization of Clark continues, and it's just getting rolling. And no sooner is Caitlin Clark a member of the Indiana Fever that it's announced on Twitter, hey, we ran out of hot dogs. Who runs out of hot dogs? Fanatics. Not having a great stretch. Schwitzy uniforms, torn up, mismatched, bad lettering. The union's angry. The players are angry, supposedly. There's one thing you got to get right. Don't run out of uniforms that people are buying because they're watching the draft in Brooklyn. Everyone's dressed to the nines. It was like an Oscar thing. We should have done live from the stained carpet. And WNBA draft edition. We could have done a pregame the way they walked the red carpet getting off of a stagecoach, not a limo. They got off a, like the Marlins bus, off the bus, pictures taken. Caitlin Clark and Prada looking fantastic and ready to go. Angel Reese was there. Everybody was there. The strangest part about the WNBA draft, though, when I tell you a few facts about it, I think you may laugh. There's 12 teams in the WNBA, 12 teams. There's 12 women on a roster. There's three rounds of a draft. That's 36 picks in a draft. You're lucky if you make a team, period. Let's say half, not even half of the women will be in the WNBA. Now the first rounders will make it. Caitlin Clark may or may not have an impact. She certainly is having an off the court impact. We got to see what will happen on the court. The pay scale for these women, we've talked about it before. I just want to make sure you have it straight. All, doesn't matter. One, two, three, four. Top four picks get the same amount. Get ready. $76,000. That's their salary. But don't worry. They get a raise to 78 and then a raise to 85 and then an option for 97. So Caitlin Clark could be a four-year WNBA player making under a hundred grand if the team picks up the option on her. I'm not saying that we should go Eva Perón and start crying for her Argentina. I am merely saying that when people talk about the health of the WNBA, the excitement of the WNBA, one of the indicators to look for in an industry in terms of how it's doing is how much are the people 
getting paid? Front office people, salespeople, players. What's the pay scale like? It's hard for me to take seriously a league that pays its players $76,000 to be drafted first. But it's financially quite responsible because the WNBA is having a hard time making money. But they think this is their time. And the reason why some of the previous greats are less than, shall we say, less than positive that Clark will have the impact that they couldn't have or didn't have. There were some great, great NBA players, pre-Magic and Bird, who had no ability to raise the NBA level to the place where it now sits. People forget what the NBA was when their finals games were shown only on tape delay at 11.30 at night. That was the slot for an NBA finals game. Then Magic and Bird come in the league and everything changes. So is it possible that Caitlin Clark is the catalyst for this change? Yes. But when you are the catalyst for change and you saw it in winning time, when you're the catalyst for change, you get paid for being that catalyst. Magic Johnson, 25 million for 25 years. Remember that big contract? Turned out to be a pretty smart job by Jerry Buss when he was mocked for doing it. The reason why the WNBA players, there is no ability to sign a player like Caitlin Clark to an amount of money she's worth is that there are true financial fair play levels in place that have a quashing impact on salary. So we'll see what happens going forward. But if you're going to be the WNBA and you're going to expand, the commissioner use the opportunity to say, hey, we're expanding. They have a team coming to the Bay Area and they want to get into South Florida or Nashville where I am. I mean, hey, let's get baseball. Let's get WNBA. Let's go. The funny part is that with expansion, it's with expansion, it's going to be very interesting to see whether or not there will be an increase in the highest amount of money that a player can make cuz right now it's pretty much done. You can make 250 grand, that's the AAV in the WNBA and that's it. Well, as long as that happens, then you're always going to be considered a second class league. And I know that Kathy has great interest in making her league first class. To do that, you got to start paying your players. To do that, you have to capitalize and get more revenue. To do that, we have to pay attention to the new broadcast deal. That's where all of this is going to be very, very obvious when either they're part of the NBA or not, either they double or they don't. We're going to find out. I'll tell you that. Caitlin Clark is a member of the Indiana Fever, and I've caught it. I didn't have to worry much when players would speak to the media. It would be a newspaper article. It would be a news cycle. Then it would be gone. Then, of course, the internet, whatever you say will last forever. You can pay people to clean up your Google, but generally it doesn't work. Generally, people don't do that. You have to just repopulate it. Speaking from experience, repopulating Google is totally doable. There were early adapters of social media, but I didn't think about it much. Now it is a huge part of what a front office deals with. And it is whack-a-mole when PR departments and social media departments are trying to see what players are doing and what they're saying. I had a very simple rule as president of a team. I want to know every single thing every player says in public. I want to see a printout and I want to know from my head of PR if there's something I need to be thinking about. Are there any issues? I just didn't like to be blindsided. Irony of irony, survivor call out. But I just wanted to have information. And in this day and age, having information is both easier, but there's so much more of it that there's stuff you can miss. Tyler Glasnow went on the Chris Rose Rotation podcast, and he had a few things to say about a few subjects that are quite interesting and should be interesting to the Dodgers, certainly are interesting to me. Let me start with what he said about Mizuhara, if you don't mind. 
He said, yeah, when we met him, he was pretty sketchy. That was his quote. They thought he was sketchy. I think he said, we all knew early on that Ipe was doing some shady stuff. Hey, why didn't you tell Shohei? I'm just curious. Do people think that the only way Tyler Glasnow could speak to Shohei Otani was by going through Ipe? It's not true. Now, Ipe and Shohei are best friends. They're together all the time. No doubt about that. But teammates are engaged with Shohei, just like they were engaged with Ichiro. So I find it hard to believe that everybody knew that Ipe was doing some shady stuff and Otani only found out in the hotel room in Korea. The Dodgers players needed to have been told and likely now have been told, just zip it. Stop talking about Otani and the interpreter. Focus on the Dodgers and the fact that we're going to win 189 games. Focus on the fact we're going to get our first ring since COVID. Focus on how great, Tyler, you're doing. Focus on the fact that you're the biggest favorite of the night and you're going to crush the Nationals. Side note, the Dodgers lost. I don't know what the Dodgers record is. What is it? 10 and 11, 12 and 8, 12 and 7, 12 and 6, 11 and 8, 11 and 8. That's not on pace to win a buck 20. I'll tell you that. There are teams on pace to lose a buck 20, but 11 8 doesn't get you to a buck 20. That said, let's talk about what else Tyler said. What's the number one subject that baseball is facing right now? Okay. What's the number two subject that baseball is following right now? Injuries. Tommy John, shoulder, all of these injuries. Well, Tyler Glasnow went on the podcast, Chris Rose Rotation, and he dropped one of the great truth bombs of all time. He said, very simply, to summarize, if I had a choice between throwing hard and getting hurt, I choose throwing hard. He said, I think the decision of throwing hard and getting hurt is going to win every single time. The only negative side is you can't contribute to your team. That's pretty negative. And then you're out for a year. Well, that stinks too. Everyone's going to take throw hard, get hurt, make money. It's just logically the choice everyone's going to make. And then he said, because of the times I didn't go after velocity, I didn't go after all that stuff. I had a 7.7 earned run average. I've never been Greg Maddox. <laughs> All right, let me break it down just for a quick sec. Let me take a beat. I guess no one believes it when I say it. We want velocity. We pay for velocity. You want to know how to stop injuries? I have the solution. Everyone's saying there's no solution, no solution. I've got a solution. Don't pay for velocity. Any pitch that's over 96 miles an hour is an automatic ball. How about try that? You're saying, David, that's ridiculous. That's never going to happen. People love the cheese. Give them the fastball. I forgot the name of the character. I can't believe it. Give them the heater. I can make my voice sound like him. It's the movie's Major League. And he's talking about Charlie Sheen at the end of the game. God dang it. Coke, I'm having a minute. People have loved the hard stuff for a long time. If you go back at Major League, it's like a 30-year-old movie. When he hits 96, 97, 98, 99, the crowd goes crazy. Now you got to be Sid Finch, literally, in order to make the crowd go crazy. And then you get hurt. And what Glasnow is saying is exactly the problem. That's it. We don't need to hear from another player. We don't need to do a study. MLB's doing a study. The union's doing a study. Forget the studies. Lou Brown was the character I was thinking of. Coca, you nailed it. Forget the curveball. Give him a heater. Can't you just picture him having heaters like in between at bats? My solution is the ultimate solution. Because what Tyler Glasnow said is exactly what all pitchers think. It's exactly what front offices think. 
Now, strange, because as a front office connoisseur, when you sign a pitcher to a long-term deal, you sort of don't want what Glasnow is saying they're good with, which is, hey, you get hurt, you get hurt, you're out for a year. You can't contribute. BFD. Well, it's a BFD to me because I'm paying you not to play. That means I'm going to lose. But on the other hand, I'm willing to take the chance because when I'm evaluating players, I'm saying, ooh, he sits at 98. He's got a cutter. It's got movement. I like it. Bring him in. Sign him. So my solution, anything over 96 is a ball, and every pitcher gets a one-year deal. That'll stop pitchers from pitching in pain because they won't want to miss a year. It's either Tyler Glasnow, he missed a year. He got an extension. He got a $25 million deal from Tampa when he missed his year with his injury. And if you're ready under a long-term deal, what do you care? You're getting paid. Oh, it stops you from helping your team and being competitive. I've never heard a player who gets Tommy John who says to me, oh, David, I'm so sorry about the team. <laughs> never heard it. Maybe they are. Maybe I'm being too cynical, Coca, on a random Tuesday morning in April. But I don't think so. I got one more thing about Tyler Glass now. Side note. Forget the fact that he looks like Killian Murphy, which he does. And forget the fact that he is a six foot six, sort of interestingly awkward pitcher. Tough to repeat delivery, has some command issues sometimes, but when he's on, it's just lights out. And what an amazing addition to the Dodgers. What I keep thinking about is that I have in my mind players who I think will not be like other players. And by that, I mean, in my mind, I have players who would say, listen, this is all about the team and this is not about money. It's not about business. I wanna win. I wanna be on a team that wins. And then I'm reminded that even the players who I think will be that way are not that way. And then I'm reminded that it's okay because no one's that way. I don't know why I keep thinking that people would have an interest in anything other than self-preservation, self-worth, self-actualization, and what gets deposited every two weeks. And you heard it from Tyler. You heard it. Give me Velo. All right, Tyler, we're giving you Velo. There was a great article in The Athletic yesterday. This is my daily pitch. We're on the DraftKings Network right now. You may be watching us on YouTube. Nothing personal with David Sampson. 8 o'clock Eastern. You could be watching us on DraftKings Network, 10 o'clock Eastern. Or you could be listening. But you know that I like giving love to The Athletic. Fantastic writers. Deep dives. Interesting analysis. Any place that has Jason Stark and Ken Rosenthal writing baseball. Evan Drellick doing great investigative pieces. It's just, it is well worth your investment. Trust me. Well, they came out with an article yesterday, except what's funny, Coca, is that that's not what we're up to. <laughs> I have no idea why I did that. Okay, can we talk about what I was really going to talk about? All right, you can cut that. That was strange. I don't know why Evan Drellick was just in my head. Four, eight, six, nine. Speaking of Shohei Otani, I was supposed to transition from Ipe Glasnow to Otani. I want to talk about tax day. Yesterday was April 15th. Some of you may care. Some of you may not. Some of you may do turbo tax. Some of you may not file taxes. Hey, it's, it's your life, whatever you do. My grandfather had a great saying. He never really had a lot of money, but he said, Hey, I never mind paying taxes because no one ever gets poor paying taxes. And he's totally right. Mark Cuban did a tweet that he wanted to get flowers. He wired 228 million to the government. And it was some sort of cut against corporations and individuals who get around paying taxes. Mark Cuban is only wiring $228 million to the government because his tax planners could not come out with a way. They could not find a way to hide the gain in his sale of the Mavericks. It is extremely hard to hide and believe me, you can try when you own a team, you put shares in trust, you move it down a generation, 
you find charitable things that you can do. You do as much as you can to lower your tax burden when you sell a team, but there's a huge, huge check to the government. Huge. So Mark Cuban sends the check and it got me thinking about Shohei Otani. And when he signed with the Dodgers, I recall that I wasn't as clear as I could have been about his tax situation. He's making $2 million a year while he's playing. And that is the money that's getting taxed at the California state level. $2 million this year, $2 million next year for 10 years. Then 10 years from now, he'll start earning $68 million. And his 20 year contract is 2 million a year now and 68 million a year for the second 10 years. And the way the law is in California is wherever he happens to live, it doesn't matter where he earned the comp, which is in California for half of the top, half of the comp. Side note, you don't pay taxes. If you play for the California Angels of Anaheim, you don't pay California tax on all of your salary. You only pay it on the games that you play in California, which would be half the games plus the number of times you go visit the Dodgers. So a baseball player, like any other athlete, are paying taxes in each state that they actually do their service. So the government knows the schedule, so you can't hide it. It's very much publicly out there when you spend three days in Indiana or Wisconsin. So the rules are, and the law is that Otani could move out of state in 10 years. He could move to Florida. He could move back to Japan. It's unclear. He could move anywhere. And the law says that when he gets paid his $68 million, his accountants will be able to use the effective tax rate of the place in which he's living. And California has started the process to say, hold on, let me get this straight. We can have someone work the entirety of their contract in California, and we get paid bupkis in taxes when we've got roads to fix and ambulances to have and hospitals to have and kids to teach, there's something that doesn't smell right. So once they discovered they were not in Denmark, but they were in California, they got cracking. And you've got state senators who are talking right now. You've got bills that are in front of Congress. At this point, it's just urging Congress is a bill urging Congress to take action on the issue. This is an easy one. For all of the Hollywood movies that are filmed in LA, there are arguments to be made if you live in Monaco. So let me just make sure you're clear how this works. If you win Wimbledon. The reason why Boris Becker and so many players live in Monaco is there's no tax. It's a tax-free nation, basically. And so the income that you get, you're not taxed on the extra level. The state level is a good way to, to think about that. In Hollywood, when you work on a movie and film a movie in LA, you are paid that money. If your address at the time is in Florida, you can say, hey, I only went there. It was under six months. I don't need to pay tax there. I don't have residency there. My residency is in Florida. Baseball players are residents where they play because they're in the place longer than six months. Think about the math. April, May, June, July, August, September, October. September is six months. The general rule is 180 days, call it, which is the equivalent of six months. If you can get around paying a tax by moving somewhere, would you do it? Have you noticed everyone moving to Florida during COVID and saying, oh, it's weather related and oh, we need more things open. We need better weather. No, if I'm going to work at home, I'd rather work at a home where I'm not paying a state tax. A state tax, not E state tax. So people make decisions based on taxes. Shohei Otani, his contract, say what you will. I don't believe that was a huge factor. The deferral aspect was done for luxury tax purposes for the Dodgers. 
in order for them to have current day cash flow to sign other players, which they did, in order for them to win, which he wants them to do over the course of his 10 years. What a nice guy. But the deferral part is a significant financial boon to him. The problem is he didn't calculate because his agent, it's buffoonery what his agent did. Just ask around anyone in baseball. They didn't properly calculate that when you go too far, something's going to happen. You know, we say to kids, overexcitement leads to tears. Or we say, listen, let's just stay under the radar. If you're going to steal money, steal it $10 at a time. Don't steal a million dollars at a time. Why draw extra attention to yourself? The Otani contract is so out of this world imbalanced. It doesn't pass the smell test. Guess who else is in LA with deferred money? Freddie, Freeman, Mookie, Betts. Guess whether or not anybody in Congress or in the state legislature in California said one word about those deferral contracts. One word when Freddie will move back to Atlanta. Mookie, maybe back to Boston. Who knows? Maybe stay in LA, maybe Florida. Who knows? Not a word. You go so far as to go two plus 68 and you've basically poked the bear. Screwed it up for everybody else. Because the way this ends is they're going to change the law and they're going to make it, hey, you earn it, you pay it. We don't care about deferral. We don't care about cash flow. You earn it here, we collect it here. That makes perfect sense to me. That's how it should be. I'm not going to do an official wait to see here, Coca, because I think it's going to take a while. But I will tell you that you should not be surprised when the laws change and the deadline for it to change is 2034 because they've got their hook set into Otani and his money because his agent and he went too far. We come back, we're going to review a great movie I just watched. And then we don't talk much about the Marlins. It's part of my past, not part of my present or future, but they made a move yesterday that many of you questioned and I wanted to explain it when they sent down who's been their best pitcher in a season that has been a train wreck so far. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. Please join us every day, 8 a.m. live on the Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. Please hit subscribe if you're watching this. If you're listening to this, thank you. And if you're watching this on DraftKings Network, make sure you write into the DraftKings Network and say, hey, I'm watching this. Schedule has been tough, Coca. I admit it. I'm tired. But I'm good. I love these shows. Did a show last night in Nashville, heading to Pittsburgh later on today. Or actually, I'm flying back home, getting different clothes, then flying to Pittsburgh. I have to do a marathon on Sunday. Have We, we haven't even spoken about that. I'm supposed to go to London to run the London Marathon. I'm lucky if I can crawl the London Marathon. I'm looking at eight hours. Okay. Still finding time to watch a movie, which is fantastic. There's a new one that I had to buy. It's available for rent on April 19th. So you got about three days if you want to rent it. It's called Snack Shack. And one of the great loyal listeners of Nothing Personal, I love when you guys give me movie suggestions. I do. I had not heard of Snack Shack. And it was told, you must watch it. And the scatter report was, it's better than the girl next door. If you're going to drop that on me as a fan of the show, you're going to get the benefit of every doubt because I love your loyalty and I appreciate that you love movies. But if you're going to drop a girl next to the girl next door reference, man, you better be right. Nope. You were not right. Now, Snack Shack is absolutely worth your time. It's the story of two boys in 1991 in Nebraska. It's directed by a guy who happened to grow up in Nebraska. So I'm thinking it may be pretty close to home. 
there happens to be a young woman, young girl living next door, but only visiting. And he happens to be geeky. So, so far it's similar. And they happen to maybe like each other and maybe it's awkward, maybe it's not. So this guy, his name is Adam, is the director. And he puts together, and a, and a writer, I believe, and he puts together a movie that's a coming of age movie about two kids who are hustling and they take over a snack shack at a local pool as a way to make money. The guy from Billions, David Constable, is the father playing a part totally unlike Bones or whatever. I can't remember what his name was on Billions. He was, um, he was the number one assistant. He was the hatchet man on Billions. You'll recognize him when you see him. And Wags, thank you. He was Wags. Way to go, Coca. Appreciate that. So let me give you this review and tell you, watch Snack Shack. Don't buy it, rent it. You can get it for free, do that. Once it's on movie channels and streaming free as part of your service, I would do that versus spending money for it. That said, I enjoyed it. I really did. It made me smile. I laughed a few times. But overall, if you're looking for a movie about someone next door, stick with the girl next door. Optioning players was never an issue for me. I never had a, I never had a problem with it. I only did, I would say, I was only a part of maybe 20% of the sendouts. Most times I would not be in the room. I knew about 100% of them, but I'd only participate in like 20% of them. They really all go the same. You're in the manager's office. You send out the clubby or the pitching coach if it's a pitcher, the hitting coach if it's a hitter. You go find the player. Hey, Skipper wants you. The minute you're summoned to the Skipper's office, you know you're being sent down because you know you're a candidate to be sent down if you have options or if a player's coming back from injury. The players all know what's happening inside the clubhouse. It is very rare that you option a player to the minor leagues and that player says, oh my God, I had no idea. We've released some players who were surprised by the release designated some players who were surprised by the designation. There's been some players who are angry. They throw stuff. They storm out. I've seen it all. The Marlins optioned Max Meyer last night. And people are up in arms. Sell the team, Sherman. He's the owner of the Marlins. You guys are incompetent. You guys stink. He's your best pitcher. Well, that is true. But here's what you're all missing about this move. This is not service time manipulation. This is all about his Tommy John. He's a young pitcher recovering from Tommy John. Before the season starts, and for whatever reason, the Marlins did not announce this. Schumacher met the media and was a disaster talking about it. Before the season starts, every player knows exactly where they stand. When you are a player who's going to be on the train between AAA and the big leagues because you still got options, which means you're eligible to be taken off the team but not lost out of the organization, and then you can be recalled right back onto the team, back and forth, back and forth as needed, those players know that before the season starts. Hey, I'm on the train this year. Yes, you are. Hey, come on in. Yeah, I'm going down. My bag was packed. You're my guy. Go down there, work hard. We'll see you soon. 20 days later, welcome back. How was your time in AAA? Totally normal, totally fine. When a player's coming back from injury and they've got an innings restriction, we will go through the innings plan. There's not one pitcher coming back from Tommy John where we did not have an innings plan. And we didn't just have it like generally. You've heard me tell you the Jose story about how crushing it was what happened with his plan. That day that he pitched his final start in 2016, it was part of a plan that I violated. Anyway, you've heard the story, go back. If you're new to nothing personal, you'll hear it again. Not today though, not today. Max Meyer had an exact plan laid out for him. These are the number of innings. That's your maximum. It'll be between 
the minors and the majors. Spoiler alert, innings count at AAA the same as they count in the big leagues. The difference is the stress on the arm. You cannot replicate a big league situation in the minor leagues. Try as you may. And we send players out on rehab. It's not to get them ready for the big leagues. It's to get them ready for themselves. It's to get them comfortable that their injury is done, that they can come back to the big leagues. And again, it doesn't matter what the attendance is. 20,000 people, 2,000 people, 50,000 people. I'm talking about the speed of a big league game, the anxiety, the pressure, the firing that your muscles do at a big league game. It's all different. It can't be simulated on backfields. It can't be simulated in the minor leagues. So when people are saying, oh, Myers down in the minor leagues throwing three innings a week, why not have him pitch him in the big leagues? Because each inning is not built the same. So we're going to plan what our schedule is for Max. And then we're going to tell him. So when we call him in and say, Max, Cabrera's back, we're sending you down. We'll be in touch to let you know what day you're starting. It's completely, completely normal. I understand why fans of a three and 14 team are saying that you guys aren't trying to win. It clearly means you're folding. I guess I would argue persuasively, if you'll let me, and me defending the Marlins is hard to imagine. Well, now that Derek's gone, it's way easier. What Bruce Sherman is doing and what Peter Bendex is doing, albeit it's not popular. This is actually the way to maximize your chance to win with Max Meyer before he hits arbitration and before he hits free agency and gets too expensive. The maximum way is to have a window that can be as long as his salary is low because he's got ace potential. Unfortunately, Schumacher went public saying, hey, he's got to work on stuff. Everyone's got to work on stuff. We work on stuff up here, which begged the question, well, if we work on stuff up here, why not let Max work on it up here? Why not let players work on it in the big leagues? We're taught, don't ever say that, that, hey, we use the big leagues as our development. No, no, that's what the minor leagues is for. I never like to say, yeah, we develop players at the big league level. No, we want big leaguers. Wait to see is when I tell you something's going to happen. If it does, great. If not, great. The Marlins are going to blow a first inning lead. Wait to see. If there's one day you want to win, Coca, I'm just closing my eyes thinking about this. We made so many unpopular roster decisions, and all you want to do is just win the next day. You want to just say, hey, I told you so. Even if it's totally unrelated and your win has nothing to do with the player move or the trade, you just want it so badly. The Marlins went out to an early 3 nothing lead. They're feeling great about themselves, and they blew it again. They lost 4-3. They're off to their worst start in franchise history, 3-14, and 14, which means that I was never a part of a start this bad. Wait to see. You want to see Max Meyer back? You'll see him. He will be recalled prior to June 15th. That's the math. It's coincidentally the math on service time, but more importantly, that keeps him down to the Myers for a full month and a half. They will restrict him and he will be able to finish out the season because he can go July, August, September. That's three and a half months. In theory, that's about 15 starts. Max Meyer recalled before June 15th. Nothing personal pick of the day. Presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Check out what DraftKings has to offer this season with code SAMSON. Because life's more fun when you're in on the action. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Here we go. Nothing personal pick of the day. We had the Rangers last night. They beat the Tigers 1-0. That's a victory. We are all about basketball tonight. We have three different wagers for you on Nothing personal pick of the day presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Let's start with baseball. And you know what today is. It's PCD. And you know what we do on PCD, don't you? It's Patrick Corbin Day. 
which means we're taking the Dodgers. Now, don't be scared of the money line. It's minus two and a quarter. Don't be scared. We are going against Patrick Corbin every game this season until he's released by the Nationals. Thank you. Nothing personal pick of the day presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Let's talk about the play-in tournament. I read something, Coca. Did you read this? Can you imagine the idiocy of people out there? The Lakers would be better off tanking, losing their game tonight against the Pelicans because then they'll be the eighth seed and play the Thunder instead of being the seventh seed and playing the Nuggets. Let me get this straight. The plan for LeBron James is to lose to the Pelicans, then take the chance that they can beat the winner of the Warriors Kings because if they happen to lose that, then they're not in the playoffs at all. But you lose tonight, win against the Warriors Kings winner, and then you're the number eight seed. You get to play OKC, who's the number one seed. This way you avoid Jokic, the reigning champions. I'm knocking on Jokic's door. Hi, it's Malone. It's Coach Malone. How you doing? Who do you want to play? Do you care? Hey, what do you think's going on in LA? Oh, let's do a quick peek. Let's go through the looking glass and look at Ham talking to LeBron. Hey, Bronny, I think we should lose tonight. What? No, no, I'm serious. We don't want to play Denver. LeBron would look at him and say, what are you talking about? I'll have you fired like the rest of the coaches. For any of you who think that the Lakers are going to tank and take their chances in a one game in order to avoid a team, then you don't know LeBron. LeBron James is going to beat the Pelicans tonight, and then they're going to play the Nuggets, and I wouldn't be surprised if they can beat the Nuggets four to seven times, though I don't think they can, but I don't think they can beat OKC four to seven times. But more importantly, I don't think that LeBron James would ever show that type of weakness, ever. It's preposterous. Lakers plus one over the Pelicans. We're taking the Lakers. I'm telling you, he wants to win. And it's one fewer game on his old body. Believe me, he thinks about that. He doesn't want to play an extra game in a couple days. The night game is amazing. Warriors, Kings. Are we ready for a playoffs? Which in theory, you know, New Orleans could win tonight there in the playoffs. The Kings could win tonight. And then the Kings could beat the Lakers. And it could be New Orleans and the Kings in the playoffs. No Lakers, no Warriors. I am hanging on for dear life to my past. I'm hanging on. Lakers and Warriors will make it. Warriors two and a half over the Kings. Take it. So we're taking Lakers plus one. The DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Nothing personal pick of the day. Lakers plus one. Warriors minus two and a half. And the Dodgers on the money line. I want to talk about Rasheed Rice right now. It's sort of a serious topic, but I really did want to make sure that we were all clear about what happened. And I don't know, Coca, whether we have covered this on Nothing Personal before. I don't think we have. Rasheed Rice is the Kansas City Chiefs player who was drag racing, 119 miles an hour, got into an accident. The reason I think we covered it on some show, maybe it was on Levitard, I was shocked at how incompetent his lawyers were that after the accident where people were injured and he clearly was a fault. There's video of him leaving the scene. I mean, it was just an absolute nightmare start to finish. The lawyers came out and agreed with Rashid's statement at the time. And the statement was, my bad. I'm fully responsible. Whatever I have to pay for, I have to pay for I want to make you right. I want to make this right. I want to make you whole. Sorry. Word comes out yesterday that Rasheed Rice is getting sued for a hell of a lot of money. Because some lawyer realized, hey, I'm working against an idiot lawyer. We've got a great statement of admission already. We are halfway home. Let's go right in for the settlement because if Rasheed Rice won't settle, then we get to say, hey, you're a liar. You said that you would take care of us. We want you to replace our $77,000 car. We want you to 
pay us millions for emotional distress and pain and suffering and loss of ability to function or work or other things that we lost the ability to do. This is how you get money civilly. So Rashi Rice is getting sued. And the first thing you do when you're getting sued civilly is you zip it. You stop talking. As it is, Rashi Rice has spoken way too much. Andy Reid, the coach of the Chiefs, has taken sort of a back seat, sort of like the way he did with his son, sort of like the way he did with all the issues the Chiefs have had. Hey, you know, we're going to let it play out. We're going to wait and see. It's a, it's a wait to see. Every time they get a player who's arrested or indicted or charged or there's bad video of or drinks and drives, hey, we're going to wait. We got games to watch. We got games to prepare for. We're the Kansas City Chiefs. All we do is win. Don't you worry about this distraction. We've had worse distractions than this, and we make it through easy as pie. I think Rasheed Rice is not going to get away easy as pie in this case because his lawyers were so full of malpractice level stupidity. This is the second time this week, Coker, that I've called for the firing of an advisor. It's, it's actionable to me. What Otani's advisors did, what Rice's advisors did. Now, he's 23, he's a kid. Kids do this, it happens, it'll be a slap on the wrist. Nope. You can't go 119 on the highway and hurt people while you're doing it and cause six car accidents. It doesn't work that way. So not only is he going to get charged, which he will, but he's also going to have to settle the civil lawsuit and he's going to need a raise. I'm not saying he's going to serve prison time because he won't, but I am saying that he's going to lose millions of dollars. I like how Andy Reid, I, I try to picture Andy Reid getting the phone call because I've gotten the phone call so many times. The phone call comes in. Hey, Andy. We got a problem with rice. All right. What is it? What happened? I got to speak to him. Is this what happened with Brit? No, no, no. I mean, there's no one close to death and we hope he wasn't drunk like your son was, but we'll find out. But in the meantime, he fled the scene. Well, that's not great. All right. Do I have to call him? All right. I'm going to call him. So Andy Reed has told reporters that he actually called Rashid Rice, Rashid Rice. And Rice is not going to the off-season conditioning. He's doing it virtually. And Reed's report on the call, hey, I'm leaving it. I'm leaving that. Like we've done most of these. I'm leaving that for the law enforcement part to take place. And then we'll go from there with that. He's like a veteran. He doesn't even need to be coached anymore. He just knows it's what all coaches and owners and team presidents and GMs, they should come from this playbook. Except for one thing, Andy, you don't say like we've done most of these. That shows that the Chiefs have been a cesspool of legal problems. I think that's just such a funny quote to give. Yeah, I'm doing exactly what I do every time we get a guy arrested. Whew, we're so good at it. I'm going to do a wait to see extra because I don't think we did one yesterday, Coca. I'm going to do an extra wait to see on Rasheed Rice. Here we go. I have a wait to see. I thought that he's going to get charged. Do we not have that? Because I'm adding a wait to see here that this new lawsuit against Rasheed Rice, it will be settled and there will be seven figures involved. So Rasheed Rice's lawsuit will be settled for over a million dollars for what he did. And He's going to be charged and will have to plea and he'll get community service and likely his license taken away. I don't know why anybody drag races. Go to a track. Rasheed Rice should be able to go to Homestead, rent a Lamborghini or Ferrari and drive it in circles. It's easy. Why would you get behind the wheel of a car on a regular highway and race like that? What would be the purpose in your mind? What's the upside? All I know is this. He got out of that car, and as he was walking back, he looked over his shoulders and he said, see you later. It's just business. This is nothing personal.